Okay, I'm going to try to answer this question that came up in my last video. It says, thank you, brother. Can you tell me how to respond to people who say the verse when Jesus said he came not to abolish the law but to fulfill it? Yet it says in Ephesians 2 and also Colossians that the law commandments were abolished. It's confusing to me. Um, first of all, a lot of grace people make what I think is an error to say that Jesus fulfilled the law for us, therefore... His righteousness is credited to us, as if his righteousness consists of law keeping, that he is the great law keeper, and that we are under law. And by that, they infer that if his righteousness was not imputed, we would actually be obligated to the whole of the law. And they'll actually say this. That's not true, especially for Gentiles who have no part in the covenants. Um, we were never under the law. The law was given... Uh, through Moses to Israel as a nation. Um, so no, we are not obligated. If Anyone who tells you that Jesus fulfilled all 613 of the ordinances of the law so that you don't have to fulfill them, otherwise you'd be obligated to them as a Gentile, um, is, not, is not clear about that. His righteousness did not consist of law-keeping. The law is the shadow, and Christ is the reality. That's what uh, Colossians tells us, right? And Hebrews as well. Um, and he is righteous because of who he is. He is God himself in the flesh. And his very life is righteous. He is holiness. He is light. He is love. Uh, he's perfect, right? And what he does is the embody everything he does is perfect and everything he does is righteous because of the quality of his incorruptible life it's not like somebody wrote down a bunch of lists of rules and jesus ran off and fulfilled them you know the rules are for people who you know the law was given not for the righteous but the unrighteous and the ungodly the purpose of the law is to expose sin. It's a witness against sinners. So that's uh, its position related to mankind, uh, or its function. But Jesus, his righteousness is even higher than the law. His righteousness is higher than what the law describes, just as the shadow can show you my form, but it won't show you my features. The details are when you turn and look at me directly. He cast a shadow, and that was the law. And I've used this example before, but God, Moses said, God, let me see your glory. And he said, no, you can't see my glory and live. Here's what I'll do. I'll put you in the cleft of rock, which is a type of Christ, and I will pass by, and you'll see my hinder parts. And that's what he did. And when, then Moses came down with the law. What is the law? The law is the hinder parts of God's glory. But the real glory of God is shining in the face of Jesus Christ. And the law veiled us, in a way, uh, to even protect people from seeing God's glory. But now we, with unveiled face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord are being transformed. And where's that glory? It's shining in the face of Jesus Christ. So Jesus came to reveal the glory of God in, in the flesh. And the law was the shadow that pointed to that glory. And here, it, when it talks about the righteousness that's imputed to us, it is not his law-keeping. It is his life. It's, it is himself as the righteousness to which the law was a witness. So here in Romans 3, it says, But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. So the law was a witness to it. But the law was, uh, the righteousness of God was manifested in Christ apart from law. Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all those who believe. So not only it, did Christ manifest that righteousness in himself, the righteousness of God, apart from the law, even though the law was a witness to it, but now that righteousness is manifested upon us who believe. And that's because of one act of obedience, which is his death on the cross by which he gave his life. 
That's all apart from law. The law didn't require that. He did it out of love. And he gave himself for us um, as a propitiation for our sins and to be our righteousness. Even apart from the law, that still would have worked. He didn't need the law to do that. But he gave the law to witness his righteousness and also as a witness against us so that we could see our need for him. That's its function. So when grace believers tell you Jesus fulfilled the law so that you don't have to or so that um, you can be justified as if his law, somehow he was a law keeper and he kept all these ordinances on your behalf and, and that law is still there and you're under it. Can you see that that mixes the water and gives you a sense of a mix of grace and law and doesn't deliver you from the law? It doesn't even give you permission to die to it <laughs> because he's still living to it and he's your righteousness and that righteousness is law keeping righteousness. No, that's not what we have. Now, there, it is the righteousness of the law, but it's the righteousness that the law points to, which is what? It's Christ himself and his life. It's God manifested in the flesh. It's the righteousness of God. There's no law that could capture that. Um, so that, that's the first thing. Then the second thing is, did he see? Well, that is actually, now you see also how he fulfilled it. And when the Old uh, Testament saints talked about the law, they didn't mean just one thing. They didn't just mean the Ten Commandments. They didn't just mean the um, ceremonial system. They actually meant the entire Bible. Uh, the law was the Torah. It was all the prophecies and all the types and all the shadows and all the pictures of Christ. That's what the Old Testament really is. Um, and so when it says he fulfilled the law, that's because he is everything that the law points to in shadows and types and figures and pictures and allegories and metaphors and direct speakings and prophecies. All of that is called the law to a good Old Testament saint. Just FYI. <laughs> um, we don't really see the separation doctrinally of grace and law until Paul comes and explains what's really going on. Then when we go back in the Old Testament, we can say, oh yeah, we can see grace here. That's clearly, um, you know, grace is there. Uh, and they knew grace, but they didn't need to separate it out because God had not finished his work yet. Um, and I can't get too deep into that. This is supposed to be short. So anyway, um, Jesus did fulfill the law, but not the way you think. He wasn't he didn't go and do it. Uh, he was the righteousness that the law pointed to and is. And he didn't give us his law keeping. He gave us his life. And that was what justifies us is Christ himself. It's his very life. It's his very person that covers you. It's much deeper. Uh, it's not like he went and just took a test for you and now you get the A. <laughs> no, he gave you his life to be joined to you forever and to be your representation before God forever and uh, to qualify you forever on the basis of who he is, apart from the law, okay? Um, all right, so then the other question is, so that, that should an actually answer, though, a little bit, are we under the law? Uh do we have to, you know, think of it that way? Well, uh, the other thing is, she said, you know, the commandments were blotted out. How can that be if he fulfilled it? And there's, this is where it's the old creation and the new creation, and we overlap both. The new creation was produced in the death and resurrection of Christ, which was a transfer for us. We were transferred out of Adam, and we were transferred into Christ. We were transferred out of the old creation that didn't have God and brought into the new creation whose content is God. And uh, in that new creation, there is no law. 
because we were recreated in his image after true righteousness and holiness. And the law is a witness against sin. The law was given for the unrighteous. Well, we're righteous now. We have Christ as our life. He doesn't need a law. He is holy. He is true. And we've been recreated in him. We've been put into him. And he's our content and our life. But that's only true in the new creation. So as long as the heavens and the earth are here in this old creation, the law is still out there doing its work of hopefully bringing sinners to a realization that they need a savior. And that'll even go all the way through the millennium because there will be mortals born, even though Jesus is on the throne, who apparently will still be sinners because they'll be capable of rebellion, which happens at the end of the millennium when the Gog and Magog rise up again and have a final rebellion and the nations are deceived again by Satan. Then finally... After he puts that great rebellion down, he brings in the new heavens and the new earth. And in the new heavens and the new earth, everything is new. Everything is uh, brought into the sphere that we've already been brought into kind of halfway. Because we're in the old and the new creation. We have our spirit that's been recreated and our mind, which is sometimes renewed. And sometimes the life of Christ is actually manifested in our body. But we are also dwelling in this flesh, which is still part of the old creation. And the flesh still corresponds with the law. That's why if uh, Romans says um, there's no condemnation for those who walk uh, in Christ, for those who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit, that condemnation is not talking about condemnation in heaven. We've already been delivered from that because Jesus uh, presented his blood in heaven in the courtroom there. But we experience inward condemnation when we walk according to the flesh. If we get our eyes off the gospel and what God has done for us in Christ and walk in our own strength over time, sin will come out. And then we find that the Bible becomes very condemning to us unless we know how to put on Christ by believing the gospel. And what is that? That's the law. The law is still functioning out there. And when our flesh isn't being dealt with by the cross, we find that the law comes back and condemns us. And that's not God doing that. It's just that the law is still out there. <laughs> and so it, where was it blotted out? It was blotted out on the cross, right? Ephesians 2 and Colossians says uh, that, well, Ephesians 2 says that he... Um, took away the, he, uh, he killed the enmity, the commandments of, or, and in ordinances, right, contained in ordinances, making peace between Jew and Gentile and reconciling them both in one body to God, making peace. He made peace by taking that out of the way, uh, and made in himself, the two groups and God into one new man, which is the new creation. The cross was a creative act, and God uh, in Christ created the new creation on the cross, Um, as well as in that new creation, terminating the law. And so in Colossians, what it says that he blotted out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, and also made an open show of the principalities, they were against us too, and they used the law to condemn us. Uh, he triumphed over in them in, in the cross, in his death. So where is the law terminated? Not in the world, not in the flesh, but in the body of Christ's flesh. And we're the only ones who've been brought into his death. When we believed, we were made um, part of the new man. We were brought into the new creation. We were transferred out of Adam. We were brought out of the realm of the Uh, law and we were transferred out of the flesh too because romans 8 says we're no longer in the flesh but in the spirit if indeed the spirit of god dwells in you right so we are no longer in the flesh according to god we are in the spirit and in the spirit there is no the law doesn't have anything to say it witnesses the righteousness that we exhibit when we walk according to the spirit which is why romans 8 says uh 
that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit, right? Um, so the righteousness of the law is not uh, consist of law keeping, but it's the righteousness t- that the law pointed to, which is Christ himself as our life. And that is all a reality only in the new creation. As far as the old creation goes, nothing changed. It's all out there still. <laughs> you know, it, he did destroy the devil for in the new creation. He has no place. He did dis, uh, blot out the law in the new creation. It has no place. He did deal with sin in the new creation. It has no place. He brought us out of darkness in the new creation. It has no place. And he brought us into the kingdom. Where's the kingdom? It's in the new creation, which is hidden in this age. But the rest of the world is still the same way it was, untouched. It has an appointment with um, Christ who's going to bring it all under his headship and deal with it once and for all. He's going to administer what he purchased the right to do through his death, if that makes sense. So it's complicated, but um, yes, Christ fulfilled the law in that the law is a shadow pointing to Christ who is the reality, and he gave us his life. And uh, secondly, the law has been blotted out in the new creation. There is no need for it. Um, Because the law is only for exposing sin. There's no sin in the new creation. And it's only for the unrighteous. And the new creation, we're righteous. But if you walk according to the flesh... The law will come up sometimes, but the way to deal with it is to come back to Christ and believe on the blood and reckon yourself dead Uh, because the law has no right to accuse you anymore, even though it's out there. That's not God's whip to beat his children. (laughs) It really has no righteous place in our uh, Christian life. We need to... um, run to Christ every time and let him be our life. Okay, hopefully this helped.